Hi, I'm Connor Friedersdorf, a staff writer at The Atlantic Magazine. And I'm Daniel Tehan. I'm a student uh, journalist and activist at Princeton. And I've been writing a lot about the student protests that have been happening all over the country. You are a critic of the way that the media has been covering these protests. So why don't you jump in and start off with whatever you want to talk about? What do you think that the media is getting wrong? And uh, what's your take on all of this? Sure. So um, I think I think uh, you've been part of some of this already with the, the conversations with Jelani Cobb at The New Yorker and some of the criticisms that he had um, of your articles. I think the sense on campuses um, is that the media has kind of helped make this about free speech in a way that it didn't necessarily have to be. Um, you have these protests that, you know, are all kind of different and have their own demands, but are generally protesting um, racist campus cultures, racist, you know, events that happen on, on campus. Um, and yet the media, the way that the media has covered it has kind of largely revolved around this question of free speech. Um, and I think there's some frustration that that is distracted from the, the substance of the protesters' demands and the problems that they've been talking about on campus. Um, and, you know, yeah, I think that that is really the main frustration. And it also, the opposition, this free speech attack on the protest has given opponents of, of the protesters on campus a kind of cause to rally around and has allowed um, for kind of a, a switch of the terms of the debate on campus as well. So the, the media narrative has kind of also suffused the campus narrative in a way that I think a lot of people feel detracts from what the protest actually started as. And just to be clear, do you think that there is a tension between uh, the demands of the protesters and free speech, or do you, and but it's the tension is distracting from more important things, or do you feel that there in fact is no tension between the two? Um, I think there are a lot of different protests going on right now. I think at Princeton, uh, which is the context I'm most familiar with, there's really not a tension. And I think it's uh, it the main opposition to the protests at Princeton have coalesced around uh, something called the Princeton Open Campus Coalition, who insists that there is this free speech issue, issue at play. But I think that there's no real First Amendment free speech issue going on at Princeton. I think there are certain cases um, across the country that people have picked up on where there are actually legitimate free speech grievances to be had. But I think that focusing on those specific instances distracts from the larger the larger discussion that's been going on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I guess initially I want to respond to you in the same way uh, that I responded to Jelani Cobb uh, when, when we debated sure. these things, which is to say that um, first this is – I think the most challenging thing about writing about this issue is that there are these protests going on at campuses across the country, and in some sense they all – see themselves in solidarity with one another, or uh, everyone agrees that there's at least some common themes here. At the same time, every campus is uh, an individual culture with, uh, you know, some Republic campuses where the First Amendment uh, does come into play. Others are private campuses. Even beyond the free speech issue, there are all sorts of differences between these institutions. And so I've tried to write about individual cases as much as possible. Uh, you know, I was just writing... Um, a piece I published today about what was going on at Overland. I've published pieces about UCLA, about Missouri, about Yale. And I've, I've yeah. tried to kind of take them one at a time um, to, to avoid saying this is what's happening on college campuses, even though uh, th there are common themes. Uh, one is certainly, as you say, um, student upset about what they perceive as racist campus climates. And so with respect to Yale and Missouri, the, the first two um, – and UCLA as well, the first three actually that I wrote about. It, it seems to me that it, it isn't the media in these cases that decided to um, to make these controversies partly about free speech. Um, at UCLA, there was a clear First Amendment issue with the administration punishing a fraternity that held a Kanye Western theme party, uh, which is certainly protected speech, and UCLA is a public institution. And this is the sort of administrative punishment of free speech that, uh, you know, if, if not pushed back upon, would set a precedent that would narrow free speech protections at UCLA. And uh, I would argue for reasons maybe we'll get into that uh, protecting free speech protections at UCLA is really important for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, one of those reasons is that uh, speech restrictions tend to impact marginalized students the most. And we see this at UCLA right now where the rights of Palestinian students are, are coming under fire 
uh, within the UC system where people want to punish some things that I regard as protected speech that's critical of Israel. Um, at, uh, at Missouri, again, I don't think that it's the media that decided to make it about free speech. I think that the media was covering the Missouri protests um, because of the angle of one student hunger striking and because uh, it was remarkable to see a football team say we're not going to play unless our grievances are met. Uh, and then you have this scene um, on the campus quad where, uh, you know, two professors and a bunch of students are preventing the student photographer from um, taking pictures in a way that is certainly his uh, First Amendment right to do as a member of the media. And, you know, one of these faculty members yelled out about another journalist who was there, hey, somebody come over, I need some muscle to get this person out of here. Um, and yeah. and she turned out to be a faculty member in, in the School of Communications. And, and again, um, that, that isn't when the media began to cover the Missouri protests. There had been a ton of coverage before that. Uh, but I think it was quite proper uh, not to stop covering the grievances of the student protesters when that happened, um, but to write about that because I think it was, uh, you know, an outrageous thing. And again, um, you know, I think when it comes to civil liberties in general, um, another thing, and I'm sorry if people uh, have listened to my my debate with Johnny Calvin, I'm repeating myself, but, um, you know, one thing about defending civil liberties in general is you don't really get to pick your moments. Um Anwar al-Awlaki is the al-Qaeda terrorist who was killed by President Obama in a drone strike, and he was an American citizen. And because he was an American citizen, there were um, serious due process problems with this. And as someone who cares about due process in the Fourth Amendment, um, I wrote about it a whole lot. Um, Anwar al-Awlaki is not the guy that I would pick as my poster child if I got to pick when I was defending yeah. due process. Uh, uh, but unfortunately... You know, Fourth Amendment cases often involve uh, criminals that the police have mistreated in some way, even though they are, in fact, criminals, uh, in this case, a terrorist. And so um, the flip side of this is like on college campuses, you know, I'm sympathetic to some of the student complaints, some a lot more than others. Generally, I'm sympathetic to young people, and I think they make sympathetic characters. Uh, all of us um, older people were in college at some point, and we look back and uh, we, we see a, a lot of them in ourselves, right? Um, but when these free speech issues come up, I think it's important to write about them because um, th that's the only way to defend them is to defend them when they come up. Yeah, I guess, you know, I, I don't think anybody really disputes that free speech, the First Amendment, is important and should be upheld. But I think there's a, there's a sense in which the, the exceptional cases get latched, latched upon. And they really, I mean, I, I appreciate the media has been covering the protests in, in more ways, but this is really the, the narrative that is dominated and also the one that's diffused down to college campuses. So I think really, I mean, the arguments about free speech about colleges not taking action to censor people, those arguments are really directed at the institutions that have the power to censor the speech. And yet they're being used against the protesters who are calling for a wide array of things. But the calls that they're making for the, you know, that I mean, at, at, at Mizzou, it wasn't even an issue of, you know, something that the protesters as a whole were doing. It was an incident that happened that got latched, up, latched upon. Um, UCLA is different. But I think that this argument about not restricting speech, it's an important one. I don't think it's one that really that many people disagree with. Right. And at UCLA, it may have been an issue. But free speech protections are done by the government. They're done by institutions. So we should hold them accountable for protecting speech. And yet these arguments come down on the protesters who, by and large, are talking about much bigger, much different issues. And I think that's and, you know, there is a real sense in which this particular argument has caught on in the media and has come to really dominate the narrative in a way that I think has kind of hurt these student protesters um, because it gives it gives their opponents a, you know, a now national publicized narrative to, to latch to latch upon themselves and to use to oppose the the protest as a whole in a way that I think is pretty damaging so like at Princeton we have these protesters who are you know calling for a wide array of things you know there's the thing about the Wilson school that has been really made you know publicized by the press as well but there are also different demands about um, creating a, a course requirement that's you know more sensitive to the history of marginalized people there's um, demands for you know, cultural sensitivity training for faculty. And the overwhelming response to this comes in the form of the Open Campus Coalition, which is 
um, you know, dedicated towards preserving free speech, open dialogue, academic freedom, all these things that aren't being challenged by the protests. But because it has become such an accepted way of responding to the protests, um, even if it might be, even if the argument that free speech is threatened is only legitimate in certain contexts, um, it has now become this like ubiquitous argument against against the protests. Um, yeah, well, so I guess hmm, I want to grant one point, which is that um, I, I think it's really hard to characterize how the media is covering something without really doing a kind of fine grained um, analysis. Right. But sure. But um, but, but I certainly grant the point, you know, as a. Uh, as an analytic matter that the media ought to be covering not just the free speech controversies, um, but the whole range of things that are going on in college campuses and that there are other important things that are happening. Um, and I, 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 so that, that, that's where I, um, that's where I agree with you. And, and certainly some media outlets, uh, I think it's fair to say are definitely focusing only on the sort of, uh, most egregious free speech, uh, things, uh, or, or the most kind of, um, extreme and unrepresentative moments and presenting them as if they are what's going on on every college campus all the time. Uh, and I think it's careful to steer away from that. I, I, I think that I would probably share your criticism of um, a whole bunch of discrete examples of media coverage. Where, where I want to disagree with you, though, is when you say that, um, you know, there may be a couple examples here and there, UCLA, uh, perhaps being one of them, but in general, no one is really opposed to free speech. Um, I think that there doesn't have to be any tension between um, the protesters who want to improve campus climate, who want to make changes to uh, the curriculum uh, and free speech, especially First Amendment rights. Um, but, but I think that there is, in fact, a tension. And uh, I think you see it at public institutions where, uh, again, um, you know, it was the administrators at UCLA that punished this fraternity, uh, but it was students who were demanding the punishment and wanting them to be punished more. You see similar cases at other public institutions where uh, there are demands to punish free speech uh, that would definitely transgress against the First Amendment. And I, I want to be clear in separating this that a place like Yale, another place that I've written about, is not uh, bound by the First Amendment. Uh, its, its administration can certainly punish more speech if they want to, than a public university can. Um, but at Yale, we see students who are also calling for uh, the speech, in this case, of a faculty member to be punished. And I would argue that this Halloween email that you may be familiar with, that um, yeah. that the wife of a um, professor in residence essentially sent out, um, I, I don't think it, it's fairly characterized as racist. The students certainly formally demanded that that lecturer and her uh, professor husband be removed from their positions in residential life and sanctioned specifically for this speech. Um, you know, and also at Yale, you had students who were spitting on people leaving a, a talk that they didn't agree with. Um, and, and I don't think this is particular to Yale. The demands.org has posts of a lot of demands from campuses all over America. And, um, you see a lot of things that, that conflict with free speech and, and setting aside the question of whether um, these grievances are correct or not, which we can talk about later if you want to. Um, you know, you have people wanting to ban Yik Yak and, and other social media apps um, on campus. You have people wanting to punish what they label as hate speech. You have people wanting to um, have formal systems to track uh, what they dub as microaggressions. Uh, you have um, various calls to, uh, you know, have the administration police expression more such as, you know, Halloween costume parties are the biggest example, but there are lots of other examples of, uh, sort of cultural sensitivity things where students are demanding a heavier hand from the administration. Sometimes, uh, you know, at Amherst, the students were calling for formal, uh, like judicial board, or I, I don't know what they call it there, but, um, to sanction students who say the wrong thing, right? And so we can talk about the merits of all of those things, um, but I think we can at least safely say that there are real tensions and conflicts between free speech and the demands of different protesters at different campuses all over the country. And, um, you know, 
it's free expression and free speech and the free exchange of ideas on college campuses uh, are all things that a lot of people care about deeply and want to safeguard. And so long as they're part of what college protesters are doing, they're going to have a constituency that might otherwise be more sympathetic to them who are going to be pushing back and saying, no, these things are really important. You're going to do more harm than good if you succeed. Yeah, I think there's also... I just I think there's a difference in between saying, you know, these protesters demands are unreasonable and like they're not how I would have framed this argument if I were making it. And, you know, saying that free speech is actually being impaired, because I think, you know, there was an article at Vox the other day about this, about how, you know, these kinds of campus activist movements have always been in existence and as long anywhere there's an activist movement with a range of ideologies and you know people who are more and less radical there will be these demands that really sound outrageous if they become widely publicized the difference is for most time that college activist movements have been around they haven't been widely publicized it's only now that there's this you know increased social media increased media of all different kinds and a lot more attention being drawn to college campuses that the instances where these unreasonable sounding demands are made are getting picked up on and putting into the mainstream so that we can name each one of them in the way that you did, that there they exist at all these different colleges. I have no doubt that like at any college where there is a, a protest of this nature going on, there are at least some people that are calling um, for these speech restrictions. I'm sure they've also always been doing things that, you know, we might say are infringed on different kinds of civil liberties. I think when we actually should be worried that these things are happening is when, you know, an institution or a government steps in, you know, we talked about public institutions at UCLA. I don't think that's happening as frequently. I don't think that speech is actually being censored in the way that um, the, you know, uproar around it would indicate that it is. And I think that. Well, don't, you know, but don't you think that, that the uproar is one reason why, um, why it's not being censored? Because th there's an understanding among college administrators that, uh, that journalists like me, that alumni, that uh, other people off campus are going to um, be upset and push back if they if they cave to student demands to to censor speech. Sure, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know, La like so this this issue at Princeton has kind of predated this falls wave yeah. of yeah could, could you actually uh, why, why don't you tell us just give us an overview of what's going on at princeton the the thing that i'm most aware of and actually sort of sympathetic to is wanting to remove president wilson's name um yeah but uh but i know that that's, there's more to it than that so yeah give, give us yeah that's certainly the 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 demand of the protesters that's gotten the most attention um and you know under for understandable reasons it's you know it's caught on in the media um basically there's this group at princeton called the black justice league they formed uh, last year in the time that all of the stuff around Ferguson was happening, and they've been a uh, force on campus since kind of pushing the administration to, to make some of the policy changes and to be more responsive to students in the way that other protesters have been pushing their administrations. And this fall, um, they, in coordination with a lot of other movements that were going on at the time, hosted a sit-in of Nassau Hall, which is the main administrative building on Princeton's campus. Um, and the sit-in was in the president of the university, President Isaac Cooper's office. And they basically had three demands. The first of which was to remove Woodrow Wilson's name from the Woodrow Wilson School, of, um, which is a, a big major at Princeton. The second was um, for a kind of cultural space for black students on campus within uh, the Field Center, which is like a, a, a diversity center on campus. And um, the third demand had to do with cultural competency training for faculty. Um, and since then, there's also been a, a demand for a distribution requirement uh, in the history of marginalized and oppressed people uh, to be one of the distribution requirements that Princeton has, um, which are just broad categories in which every student has to take one class during their time at Princeton. Mm -hmm. um, so there was this sit-in that lasted for 36 hours, and it ended with the president and a couple of other administrators signing a letter agreeing to start processes to uh, evaluate all of these different demands. Uh, but it has sort of created this huge uh, commotion on campus, and also it's, it's garnered a lot of attention in the media, uh, mostly around the Wilson issue. On campus, it's it's taken you know a look at all of these issues. But there's been a huge backlash both on campus um, 
and in, in some media against, you know, the, the, the BJL, Black Justice League. Um, and in response, as I think I mentioned earlier, there's this formation of this group called the Princeton Open Campus Coalition, um, which has kind of been the most visible um, structure opposing the, the protesters. Um, and they have really rallied around this idea of academic free discourse and free exchange of ideas being threatened um, by the protesters. And I think the response that they've had is kind of indicative of the ways that that people have been responding to the protests. Um, I think it, the, the protesters at Princeton really didn't raise a, certainly not a constitutional free speech issue, really not even at Princeton an institutional free speech issue. Um, people who are opposed to the demands for whatever reason um, have instead been saying that they now feel s- that their their speech, their opposition has been stigmatized. Um, there's this idea of like social censorship being thrown around. And basically the, the idea that people criticizing the protests are being criticized and that criticism is then impinging on their right to free speech. Um, so that's become a really dominant campus discourse with lots of, you know, ink spilled about it in the in the paper and everything like that. Yeah. So well, that's, that's the general background. So, so I'm curious what you think. Um, l- let's stipulate that if, even if someone's speech is stigmatized by um, campus activists, you know, if someone speaks up against their demands and they say, well, you know, that's, um, that's problematic or that even that's racist, that's not impinging on anyone's free speech. It's, it's you know, harsh criticism, uh, but it's not a, a free speech issue per se. Uh, right. It, it does raise this... You know, if we could put it in a separate bucket, it raises the issue of, you know, when stigma should be used on college campuses. Is it, um, is it both, you know, I guess, is it legitimate as a matter of process, and is it, is it uh, substantively correct to stigmatize opponents of some of these demands? Let's say we're talking about. Uh, let's see, I jotted it down as you were writing. Let's say we're talking about cultural competency training for faculty, right? Um, mm-hmm. if, if someone is opposed to that and says, I don't, I don't think that we should add this for faculty, uh, is it fair to stigmatize them uh, as, you know, insensitive to the demands of marginalized people or uh, racist, xenophobe, you know, whatever the, whatever the stigma is, I don't know, that, that people at Princeton are saying that they're getting labeled with? I think... I don't know. I think the act of, I think there's a lot of kind of very performative discourse going on in this, in this conversation. Yeah. And like, there's almost a presupposition that these people are talking past each other. Yeah. Um, and I think that what you're saying, what, we're, what we say when you stigmatize a kind of speech is that your speech is not, you're not making a, you're being disingenuous. You're coming from a place of like racism and you're kind of, your speech act is indicative of like, this ideology of white supremacy or, you know, racism in some way. Right. Um, I think that to say that for someone who opposes the BJL on the grounds of free speech is closer to the truth than somebody who opposes the protesters and say that they are impinging on free speech. I think that, you know, both sides are doing something where they're linking what the other side is doing to something that's really repulsive, right? Racism on one side and this attack on something that's a sacred value for a lot of people on the other side. Uh-huh. So in the same way that the protesters are saying your your speech your speech acts are indicative of an underlying ideology of racism, white supremacy, the Open Campus Coalition is saying your your actions, your protests are indicative of this hatred for the First Amendment and this you know lack of respect for free speech. And I th- I personally think that that argument in this case is completely misguided. And I think that there's a lot more um, that the argument on the other side is a little more grounded, that there are people that um, are kind of reacting to anti-racism by using free speech in a disingenuous way that reflects more a kind of desire to preserve the status quo that kind of props up institutions of white supremacy than actually concerned with this free speech issue. Well, so let's, um, Let's go a little bit farther with this point. Would you say that it's fair to describe Princeton as an institution of white supremacy? Uh, yeah, I, I would. I think 
I think that in, you know, in the sense that white supremacy permeates American culture, it permeates its institutions of higher education and Princeton is not exempt from that. Uh, so, so, so um, I'm sure some, some listeners are, are nodding their head in agreement and others are shaking their head and disagreeing with you. So, so uh, t- tell me more about this, but why um, ma- make the case for Princeton as an institution of white supremacy? So I think, I think historically these systems of oppression are inscribed in kind of like institutions of power, whether that be the government or whether that be universities or other kind of institutions. Um, and I think there's no, there's no debate that all these institutions were institutions of white supremacy at one point or another. Yeah. You know, we can talk about the government, we can talk about Princeton. Um, and I think that there is much more of a tendency to preserve the status quo in these institutions than there is to be progressive. So I don't think we've reached a point yet where we could say that the white supremacist aspects of Princeton's history that were constituted just, you know, several years ago, you know, several decades ago are completely expunged. And I think that that legacy of white supremacy continues to, to permeate the institution. I think it's the, you know, responsibility of the students, uh, and then, you know, people who are constantly entering the university, becoming part of it to help dismantle that. I think part of it is making sure that Princeton accepts you know, students of color, which was the last Ivy League university to do. I think part of it is making sure that it, you know, recognizes African-American studies as a department, which is the last Ivy League university to do. So I think that all of these kind of historical setups of the institution that were designed and implemented by this system of white supremacy to marginalize people, I think they haven't been fully dismantled. And I think what we're seeing now is a continued effort to dismantle them. And because institutions are inherently conservative, because they inherently, not conservative in the political sense, but conservative in the sense of wanting, of resisting change, they want to preserve the status quo. I think it's always, they're always going to push back against that effort to make it more progressive, to dismantle even more of that history. Um, and I think a lot of that has played out in this, in these conversations that we've been having, um, about Woodrow Wilson's legacy, about the way that Princeton treats history, about, you know, how important is it that students have a grounding in the historical oppressions that have been perpetrated by the country and the institution. Um, so I think all those questions are still really um, desperately relevant. And I, I think it's, it would be mistaken to say that Princeton has lost its um, taint of white supremacy. I think that, you know, probably few institutions have gotten to that point. Princeton certainly hasn't. Okay. Well, so I want to say a couple of things. One, there's a sense in which I agree with you. Um, and, and I would put it this way. Um, certainly I agree that Princeton uh, was an institution of white supremacy, as were most colleges that have been around that long in America, perhaps all colleges that have been around that long in America. Um, And I think it's also true that there are policies at Princeton today that, um, hmm, how would I put this, that bring some of the effects of white supremacy into uh, life at Princeton today. Um, The clear example uh, that I'm surprised that more college protesters haven't gotten upset about is legacy admissions. Uh, You have these, you're giving a boost to students because their parents, grandparents, great grandparents attended Princeton. And those parents or more likely great grandparents or grandparents attended at a time when uh, Princeton's admissions policies were racist in a way that everyone today would acknowledge, right? And mm-hmm. so, so you're giving this population a boost and excluding this other population from that boost that uh, cannot take advantage of it because of the injustices decades ago, right? Uh, it, it seems to me to be a clear example of um, the, <laughs> the the legacy of white supremacy at Princeton today. Uh, so, so I'm not... Uh, completely antagonistic to this. And uh, again, you know, campus buildings are named after uh, people who made their money in ill-gotten ways, who had awful policies like President Wilson. Um, And I I grant that as well. I I think that what people are reacting against when people hear someone describe Princeton as white supremacist and shake their heads and, and, and dismiss it out of hand I think maybe if if I were to tell them those two things that I just said, that they would grant that those examples were going on. Um, And 
what they're trying to say and what I'm trying to say as well is I certainly don't think that the institution of Princeton today subscribes to an ideology that says that the white race is inherently supreme or that the white race should be made supreme by pulling the levers of power. Uh, I think, in fact, Princeton today is basically committed to uh, racial equality in the United States, both as a matter of ideology uh, and as a matter of uh, fact. Now, racial equality isn't the only thing that Princeton is worried about. Of course, it isn't just taking its endowment and going and, you know, improving uh, schools in cities with disproportionately uh, minority populations, right? It, it, it isn't a racial equality uh, philanthropy. It, it has this other academic mission as well. And so there's going to be tension between this thing that it wants and this other mission that it has, and it's going to spend some money here and some money there. And there's lots of competing goods that Princeton is going to have. Um, but, and, and tell me if you think that this is correct or not. Um, I, I don't think that as an institution, Princeton subscribes to the ideology of white supremacy. I don't think that the faculty at Princeton, the administration at Princeton, the staff at Princeton subscribe to the ideology of white supremacy. In fact, I think that you would find, you know, who knows what any one individual here or there might think. But broadly speaking, I think that you would find, in fact, um, potent ideological antagonism to the ideology of white supremacy and a real desire to dismantle it, even though different people might disagree with how fast it should go or the particular steps that should be taken. And so to hear Princeton be described as white supremacist uh, leaves me thinking, well, okay, then what word are we going to use for the Ku Klux Klan, right? Uh, what word are we going to use for people who really do believe that the white race is supreme and who, who want to, um, it, it, it almost seems to me to be diminishing uh, the awfulness and the power of the words by applying it to some place like Princeton when um, it, it seems to me that even the manner of protest at institutions like Princeton are presuming uh, some level of goodwill, goodwill and shared ends among the faculty and administration. Um, it, it's not, it's not like, uh, it's not like what the protesters against apartheid. It, it doesn't look like their tactics. It looks like the tactics of people who know that on some level, the people that they're protesting to are sympathetic with their ends. Sure. And, you know, you know, I'm not an absurd, I, I'm not equating the Ku Klux Klan with Princeton. Um, no, of course not. Maybe, but, maybe, but, we could get in, <laughs> maybe we could get into a little bit more like what I'm talking about with white supremacy. But first of all, I would say that it's not White supremacy, it's not like a box that you check. It's not like Princeton chooses to subscribe to this yearly. Um, I think that, but I mean, in a real sense, Princeton is respond. I mean, when we talk about things like the Ku Klux Klan, you know, the debate over Wilson is not exempt from that. He screened Birth of a Nation, made all sorts of comments about the Ku Klux Klan that, you know, were really interpreted as helping the resurgence. Um, so I think like the history of Princeton in promoting the actual ideology of racial supremacy can't be ignored. Oh, I, you know, I agree with that. Even more, yeah. I mean, even more recently, you have you have things like, you know, the the Moynihan report. There was a there was a conference discussing that at Princeton recently, and you know, I know Tanahasi Coates has written a lot about the legacy of that and the legacy that he describes and the legacy that was described at the conference were a lot different. But I think that when you're talking about the present day, yes, there are still like very blatant instantiations of white supremacy and things like the Ku Klux Klan or the Aryan Nation. But I don't, you know, when you're talking about an ideology, you're talking about something that has a spectrum. And that's that's one end of the spectrum, obviously. But that doesn't mean that institutions that have a history of white supremacy are completely exempt of it now. And I think the protests are a way of calling out the continued manifestations of white supremacy, the way that it continues um, in institutions. And, you know, it's not something that always manifests on the level of the individual. Uh, it's not always somebody, you know, professing racial discrimination, but right. I think well, I, we've so, learned that. So I, I, you know, I, I, I said one example of this, of, um, you know, one example of how white supremacy, supremacy manifests at some place like Princeton today is legacy admissions. In, in your view, what are other ways that it, it's um, manifesting today at Princeton? I mean, I think like, you know, the, the conference on the Moynihan report, which is very normalized, but I think it's less, I think that there's an urge to look for very 
concrete and I, I'm completely sympathetic to look for very concrete issues of discrimination that you can point at and say, you know, that's terrible. While the kind of background noise of constant discrimination, that's a legacy of, you know, implicit biases that, you know, research demonstrates we all have. I mean, I, I want to think about the conversation in a different context. Also, you know, the United States doesn't have any more, really any laws that profess racial discrimination. And yet there are profound effects of racial discrimination that are being inflicted on people all across the country. You've written extensively about the criminal justice system. So I'm sure you would agree that there are ways that policies that are, you know, ostensibly race blind can, you know, through discretion and other means lead to really terrible race based outcomes. Um, and I think, you know, I describe America as still suffering from the legacy of white supremacy in the same way that Princeton is because, you know, we have more African Americans incarcerated than anybody else in the world by, you know, percentage of population, by all these other things. There are oh, more, I, I, yeah. And, you know, and I absolutely grant, like, suffering from the legacy of white supremacy, I grant that about uh, the United States and Princeton, uh, certainly. Yeah. I mean, I just, I think, you know, there's an urge to find individual racists or to find individual racist policies, but there's damage that is done even even in the absence of, of villains. And there are ways that well, see, know, I, but I, I, I just... want to stop you there because, look, you mentioned um, or alluded to my work on policing and how race blind policies can lead to uh, th these very pernicious outcomes. And um, I agree with that. Uh, you know, I could look at something like stop it, fr stop and frisk that is ostensibly race blind, but in fact has these pernicious uh, outcomes that disproportionately affect black people in New York City. Right. Uh, but, but in fact, uh, first, I would argue that they're not actually applied in a race blind way. Um, but I, I can also, when it comes to policing in America, God, I can tell you 15 changes I would love to make tomorrow and what they are specifically and why those changes would address the problem. And uh, I, I think it's understandable that people uh, on college campuses like Princeton, where there is, is activism, are wanting to get down to the fine grain. Well, OK, yes, we're suffering from a legacy of white supremacy in the sense that uh, all of America is. What does that mean for us today? Surely it has to mean specific things. And so let's focus on those specific things instead of having a kind of um, larger argument about the nature of race in America that that you're never going to find unanimity about and, and that even if you did, what's the point? Yeah. And I, you know, I don't think that the protesters are just making kind of inchoate demands. I think the, the concrete things that they've pointed out, you know, in the same way that the concrete things that you pointed about police reform would do a lot. I think people, you know, I can't speak to this personally, you know, I'm, I'm a, a white guy as well, but you know, when people tell me that they face, they feel a climate that is hostile to them or that they feel that they're being made to feel out of place or that there are individual things that professors say. Um, you know, that's also something I think that we need to contend with. And I think that the, the demand of having cultural competency training of at least having our professors and our administrators understand how things like implicit bias work, understand the history of marginalization, you know, it's, those aren't, making people think a different way. It's, it's, you know, educating people about how racism still pervades. And I think that's actually like a really great example of a concrete way, uh, a concrete step that can be taken to reduce the kind of um, system of racial hostility that people feel. Okay. Well, let, let me, let me play devil's advocate on, on that particular point um, because I'm often frustrated with how these arguments play out. And um, so I'm curious what you would say in response to this. So, so here's an argument against a cultural competency requirement for professors, right? Um, I, I think the argument would go something like this. One, um, 18 year olds, 19 year olds, 20 year olds who either just got to this institution or have spent a couple of years there have taken at most two classes say with any given professor have sampled a very small number of professors at the institution generally aren't really in a position to judge the overall quality uh, of the faculty when it comes to something as inchoate as cultural competency, especially when making judgments about that are so laden with these like bigger discussions about 
ideology on campus, right? So if a law professor, um, you know, if, if a law professor uses a graphic example in a case discussing a rape and uh, adjudication that the Supreme Court has done around that rape, is that culturally insensitive to women in an objectionable way that ought to be punished? Is it culturally objectionable to sexual assault survivors, right? Um, if a student, if a professor in an economics class brings up the controversial mismatch theory that, that Richard Sander has worked on at UCLA, is that, um, is that objectionable? Should he not do that? Is that academic freedom? Is it left up to the discretion of the individual professor, right? Um, the, the underlying point is that there's no agreed upon culturally competent manner of behaving oneself in class. And the students' notions of what is culturally competent is not shaped by careful scholarly study. It's not shaped by studying a bunch of colleges. It's not shaped by looking at the needs of the institution and their educational needs. It's kind of shaped by this uh, inchoate ideology that spread across all of college campuses through progressive activists that doesn't really have a ton to do with what anyone else would call cultural competency. Um, and, and then you have the assumption that somehow sitting someone down and training them for an hour or two hours or a day or however long you want to train these faculty in cultural competency is going to somehow, you know, change the nature and classroom behavior of a 60 year old tenured professor who's been teaching sociology for 30 years. Uh, maybe he's just an asshole uh, and he's going to be whether he takes this class or not. Right. Um, and the, the larger concern beyond the time and cost of doing something like this in, in a place with finite resources is that, um, it, 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 I would argue that Princeton has infinite resources, but <laughs> well, it doesn't have infinite resources. Uh, it, it has infinite resources insofar as it's going to keep jacking up the the cost of tuition to even more absurd heights, right? And so, you know, um, I think the larger concern uh, is that any place like Princeton, like any Ivy League university that implements a cultural competency requirement. Uh, the curriculum of that requirement is not going to be um, careful and scholarly and viewpoint neutral. It's going to be, it's going to reflect the ideology and prejudices of uh, a certain brand of progressive activism. And everyone who subscribes to that is going to go and nod their heads and everyone that doesn't subscribe to it is going to shut up and keep quiet because they know that that's the thing to do to uh, not be stigmatized on campus. And it's not actually going to fix any of the underlying problems that I agree exist and ought to be addressed. Now, um, I'm certainly sympathetic to that argument. Would I endorse it right now uh, without looking at the specifics of a cultural competency requirement, like the specifics of how this is being pitched at Princeton? No, I would take a close look at it and, and, and formulate specific arguments based on what people are suggesting. Um, but, you know, it strikes me that Princeton is a research institution, right? And it's got all of these people that design these careful studies to look at very complicated problems and to glean information before formulating a solution to them. Um, that is not what's happening with the demands of college protesters at Princeton, right? Um, they have not said what we want as a first step is a careful three-year study that looks at these metrics and reaches hard conclusions about these things that we suspect based on our ideology and our feelings and our anecdotal experience uh, we, we think these things are happening. Let's study them and see if they really are happening in this careful way. Uh, in, instead, they're saying, we just got to this institution. We feel uh, uncomfortable here. Um, and we're going to presume that we understand the reason that we feel uncomfortable and that we know the solution to it. And it's those last two. It's not that they feel uncomfortable that I uh, would contest. It's not that that's a problem. I think that it is a problem and that people should be sympathetic to it and look into it carefully and figure out what's going on. Uh, it's the jump at Princeton and at all these other institutions to these very specific um, solutions that I, I, I just don't see the basis for believing that, that these are necessarily the right solution. I think, I mean, there's a lot to respond yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I'm sorry I've um, talked so long. Let, I'll let you talk for a long time now. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, in the sense that, like, people coming into the institution 
either as faculty or as students, um, need to be have a basic competency. I mean, it's not right. It's not a cultural ideology training. It's competency. It's saying you realize these basic facts that we can agree upon because there are there are things that we can agree upon. We know about how implicit biases work. We know about the history of certain things in the country. I don't think that that is this huge thing. I mean, uh, people talk a lot about catastrophizing for students. I think like certain demands, like the people who respond to them catastrophize. It's like, this is this huge change that's being made. Whereas like we, we train people in all sorts of things when they come in, into an institution. Um, for example, we, we give people sexual harassment training and, you know, both students and faculty have to learn about sexual harassment, the kind of things that create unsafe spaces because Historically, these institutions have been unsafe spaces for for women, and I think in the same way they've been unsafe spaces for people of color. So I think like you know you have something like sexual harassment training. Have, have you ever you can make a lot of <laughs> Have you ever sat through sexual harassment training? I I mean I not no. Okay, go, go ahead. Sorry. I mean I think there's also a basic acknowledgement on the, on the behalf of an institution that there are these these things that are problematic in the, in the, in the climate, in the way that policies go into effect in, you know, I think, I don't know. Do you acknowledge that students concerns that they feel unsafe in an institution are they, that they're valid, that, you know, it's possible to detect hostility from things that, you know, from, from an environment. Uh, well, cause I, I think there's, I, would... I think there's similarities in the way that, you know, you could be you could be made to feel unsafe as a as a woman in a male dominated environment, and the way that you can be made to feel unsafe as like a person of color in a white dominated environment. And I think the fact that you know we do address one and not the other right now. Uh, hmm. Um. Well. Well. First, I think that um. I, I use the word safety in the traditional sense, so I would distinguish between feeling unsafe and feeling uncomfortable. Uh, or feeling unsafe or feeling unwelcome, right? Um, certainly, there's crime on some campuses, uh, and there are, are sexual assaults on uh, most campuses. And so if someone tells me, yeah, there's been a bunch of sexual assaults on my campus this semester, I feel unsafe, um, that makes a lot more sense to me than um, I experienced a microaggression in my economics class, and that makes me feel unsafe. Uh, that makes me feel unwelcome. I totally grant that. That makes me feel um, disrespected. Uh, absolutely. Anxious? Sure. Uh, unsafe? No, I don't think that that's the right word for it. Yeah, I, I mean, I also I think there's a really interesting conversation to be had about the extension of words like safe and like violence. Um, it's something that I think about a lot. Um, but I think, I don't know, I think you you understand the point that I'm making, whether we call it safety or feeling unwelcome. Uh -huh. But I think there's a real sense in which, you know, we don't want students to feel unwelcome in an institution that has literally not welcomed them in the past. I think that if that is still the sense that people are getting, then we haven't we haven't come far enough. Um, well, um, I, I agree, but I, I think it's important to figure out why uh, they're feeling that way. And I don't know the answer. I mean, it's something that I'm trying to do a lot of reporting on right now to understand it as fully as possible. I don't expect that it's going to be the same at, at every institution. Uh, but but I don't think that the solution, you know, you were saying that we have, um, we do have this shared sense of things that, as you put it, we know things like implicit bias, which I think actually is really complicated. Uh, although I do think that it that, that it exists and manifests in, in different pernicious ways. But I, I think that there's a contradiction in what you're saying. It, it, if it's, if it's this thing that we all know that all reasonable people could just agree that it's important to teach people, um, then how is it that there are enough faculty members who ostensibly don't understand this, that they're going to be educated? It, it, it's like presuming that the, it's presuming that like a vocal minority of students somehow have entered Princeton with this common sense knowledge that faculty are somehow unaware of. And if only it could be communicated to them at an orientation type learning session, then our problems would be a lot better. That, that doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I think that there is a value in getting people in, in sort of in a way, forcing people to be thoughtful about the ways that seemingly minor things can connect to much larger issues. Um, 
I, I think it goes for a lot of different things, but I think, you know, for example, there's also this recent thing that, um, kind of interested me. I don't know if you saw it, the thing with Fitzgibbon media, the like, kind of progressive PR outlet that's had this scandal over, um, sex discrimination, sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a piece in, in Vox about it. We could link to it, but okay. basically there's this, prog this progressive PR outlet and Vox wrote an article about how, um, there was this, allegation of sexual harassment and basically there was this very um hostile climate that was that was you know in place at this progressive place and it's a seeming contradiction because you know how could all these people who you know are working for these progressive causes and representing things like Planned Parenthood and you know pro-choice groups um how can they still manifest the same ideologies that they purport to oppose and I think that you know similar things go on with racial discrimination. I don't think people realize how minor actions reinscribe the same kinds of ideologies that lead our prisons to be full of black men, even though there aren't, you know, there are all these reasons why they shouldn't be. Well, I, um, and I, I agree with, sorry, I ahead. agree with your, I, I think I agree with your big picture point, which is that, yeah, of course, even, uh, even quote unquote progressive institutions can, uh, embed pro, uh, racist practices, uh, within them. Um, of course, there are all sorts of improvements uh, that can be made to all sorts of institutions. Uh, but where I lose you is the notion that um, the notion that students somehow have a an enlightened understanding of these things that faculty don't, and that if only we could sort of put forth the shared consensus that, that all sensible people have come to, but that somehow faculty ostensibly don't know, that, that would be um, a useful step forward. Uh, I, I just, it, 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 I mean, I, I don't get, I, not, I don't get the jump. I, I don't like if, if these things are such common sense, how is it that the tenured faculty of Princeton doesn't already know them? And, and if they don't already know them, then isn't it at least possible that instead of reflecting ignorance of the cutting edge of social justice theory, what's in fact going on is that there are deep substantive and legitimate disagreements about how people ought to behave when teaching uh, a diverse classroom full of people, of how sensitive we ought to be in discussions of fraught topics, right? Um, of what sorts of things reflect implicit bias and what sorts of things in fact reflect the kinds of uh, tough conversations that you need to have on a college campus. Uh, and, and finally, um, a difference of opinion about um, what best prepares students for a world that they're going to face after graduation that's going to be a lot less friendly than whatever college campus they're on and where they might have a hostile boss or a neighbor who isn't particularly hostile but is very politically incorrect in the language that they use or any number of things that seem like since they're pervasive in the world, um, it would be helpful to teach students how to adjudicate those situations uh, with resilience so that they can thrive in the face of them rather than uh, focusing on stamping out the like uh, marginal case at Princeton, which is going to be uh, much less problematic to borrow their language than stuff that they're going to face every day in the world. I mean, I think that people at, in universities are, are realizing the ways that these, these issues, I, th I see a value in coming to learn how to question the things that are going on around you and calling out things that may seem completely natural to other people, but are actually inscribing and reinscribing these, these views. And I think that the fact that, that people are learning to do it at Princeton. I don't, I don't see the protesters as these vulnerable people, um, who are really, you know, scared. I think they're, glad they're very that. brave. I think. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? I, I mean, I, I'm glad to hear that. I, I, you know, I, I've been getting a lot of emails from, uh, college students and I've done a couple of speaking engagements and, and tried to stick around for hours on campus and talk to people. I've gone to UCLA and talked to people and w one weird thing that is going on is that, I, I mean, you've been, um, quite thoughtful th throughout our conversation. And I very much expected you to say something like what you said, but um, I've heard a lot of college students who have this weird sort of prejudice 
uh, un unwitting and well-intentioned, but prejudiced nonetheless against the black and Hispanic students on their campus. Uh, some, some of the Asian students, I've heard a lot of students like arguing about whether Asian students count as people of color, which is another whole subtopic that it seems like a bizarre yeah. argument to me. But, um, but some, some white students I talk to who are ostensibly sympathetic to and want to be allies with the black and Hispanic students protesting on their campuses, um, speak about them in this patronizing, condescending way. Uh, as if to look at someone who has a different skin color than them means that we can conclude one that they are that they're marginalized, oppressed, and fragile in a way that uh, renders you unable to treat them like a normal person or have interactions with them that presume a basic level of humanity and understanding. Uh, they uh, talk about them in the way that people talk about um, victims and the way that. Uh, in the way that they might talk about someone down the street whose wife divorced him and he lost both his legs in Iraq and now everyone pities him and feels sorry for him. And I think it does a real disservice to these students, especially um, – I think it does a real disservice to um, black young people generally. I, I think that the most some of the most courageous acts that I've seen this year – uh, in, in the United States are the Black Lives Matter protesters who have squared off against very hostile police forces and have done activism at the local level in jurisdictions where uh, they're at real physical risk. They're at real risk of corrupt institutions um, wanting to, you know, go after their block a little bit harder because some, you know, something happened in a protest and they know where the person lives and, and, and this kind of thing. Um, so I, one of the things that I have gotten the most pushback from on college campuses is saying that um, it's important to have all these discussions and address the concerns of students, whether one agrees or disagrees with them. It's also important to see them as strong, resilient people and to communicate the fact to them that they are in, you know, in the case of Princeton, at this place where uh, they are neither voiceless nor silenced. They, in fact, have a tremendous ability to affect both um, the national conversation, the trajectory of our country once they get out of these institutions and go on to what we have every reason to think are going to be fantastic jobs and careers. And uh, there, there's something patronizing that grates on me about the way that some white students talk about those protesters. I, uh, I agree that there's there's a lot that's patronizing the way that people talk about protesters. But I mean, just to go back, I was going to say, I think that they're brave because they have been so resilient and, you know, taking, you know, people can kind of trivialize what it means to take it, you know, to protest. But I think that the reaction that has come against these protesters has shown actually what a kind of brave stand it was to stand up and kind of voice their, their experiences, their lived realities, to say that this is a problem. And the fact that it's been greeted by, you know, all like sorts of condemnations and protests. And, you know, at Princeton, there was a, a bomb and a gun threat, you know, as soon as the, the sit-in ended. Um, yeah, I think it's it's really a brave step to to occupy Nassau Hall, risking disciplinary action being, you know, having your academic future, your economic future um, thrown away or, you know, severely damaged by being suspended or expelled or something like that. Um, and I think the fact that, you know, these protesters are, you know, really standing constant in their beliefs and asserting that their experience is valid in the face of this huge backlash that's come against them is is really brave. So that's what I meant by that comment. Um, um, and I think that there's also a tendency to trivialize that that element of of what's been going on, because we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be really having these conversations right now were it not for the protesters who have said these are conversations we need to be having. And I think I think when it comes to what you said about going into the real world. I think that's a valuable lesson that like if if the same kinds of problems that people are protesting at Princeton are happening in your workplace, those are also things that you should speak out against. I think that like problematizing the status quo is a really important tool. And I think, you know, if more people had done it at that PR firm, maybe it hadn't had wouldn't have had such a hostile environment. I I think it's a valuable tool to be able to constantly be scrutinizing and interrogating the environment in which you're living. Um, and I think that it's a very natural reaction for people who are being very thoughtful about all these issues of mass incarceration and race and all these bigger issues 
to take that analysis home and look at the ways in which the ideologies that that perpetrate those evils are also at play on their own campuses. And I think that is what is happening. I think, you know, this this is a movement that started in reaction to Ferguson. And these are very thoughtful people who are taking, you know, who are looking at the things that are happening and look and seeing the connections to the things that are happening closer to home. I, I, um, I, and I, yeah, I agree with you that it's very important to um, to learn the skill of questioning and the posture of questioning the status quo. Uh, I certainly agree that there's a lot in America that people ought to question more and that that posture would be enormously helpful if if the next generation has it more than uh, mine than older generations. I, I I worry that the particular incentives around protest on college campuses are ill preparing students to question the status quo in a way that is going to be constructive and uh, effective because you know you talked about a workplace um, it, it, it's certainly if students go on to have a job at some large organization let's say that they're working at uh, you know a Google or a LinkedIn or something like that and th they find something offensive to their notion of social justice um, I hope that they're able to frame their concerns in a way that is a lot more sympathetic to a non-academic audience than they have been at Princeton and other campuses. And I can't figure out if the students are savvy and using these social justice concepts because they're the most effective things on college campuses, or if they in fact, um, if they in fact really do have a completely different definition of safe that I am, they really do think it's coherent to stand with a microphone and talk about how they're being silenced as they're holding the microphone, right? Um, these kinds of communication gulfs that has a lot of the country rolling its eyes at the college students, sometimes in a way that's unfair, right? But uh, again, compared to something like Black Lives Matter that I've been covering, the college students don't seem very adept at me to communicating their concerns to people who disagree with them and persuading them rather than stigmatizing them. I think that they lean awfully heavily on telling people who disagree with them that they're just not sufficiently enlightened uh, around the right metrics of social justice. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's, I mean, you know, you talk about Black Lives Matter. I think Black Lives Matter employs a lot of the same disruptive tactics that the protesters do and to great effect. I don't see a huge difference between Black Lives Matter protesters taking over at Bernie Sanders rally um, in an effort to get him to focus more on race, uh, an action that's had a huge effect on the, the kinds of language he's used in debates and in his platform ever since, versus like protesters at Princeton taking over the president's office and making very similar arguments about how he's kind of dismissing race in the same way or not paying attention. But I also just wanted to kind of make this point because it's something you know yeah. there's this notion that this is just crazy students um and it's easy to dismiss students and there's this great narrative going on right now that's being you know promulgated by people like jonathan Haidt as well that students are really fragile and vulnerable and you know i you know whatever this is clearly something that people have been picking up on that it's students that's social justice the protests at princeton were completely supported by the african-american studies department um, the African American studies professors, the faculty that you're, you know, that we've been talking about, they co-signed a letter in support. This, these include some of the, the leading intellectuals like Eddie Gloud and Ruha Benjamin and Naomi Murakawa. Cornell West himself went to the sit-in and encouraged the protesters to keep doing what they're doing. Um, I think faculty, while it's not unanimous, there are faculty that really get it and that really do agree with the kinds of arguments that the students are making because they have experience some similar things themselves. And I think that, you know, the fact that it's not just students, but that, you know, really prominent academics also acknowledge this as a problem and are kind of in solidarity with the students who are, who are making it an issue. Um, I think it's something that, you know, should tell us that we shouldn't just be trivializing what these students are saying and dismissing them as being coddled or, you know, vulnerable or victimized or catastrophizing or all these things. Well, yeah, I, um, look, I, 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 look, there are, um, there are a lot of earnest faculty members who are 
uh, hugely formidable people and who are sympathetic with the college students. And I will grant that that, um, that, that is a point in, in the favor of taking these students seriously. Uh, as I maintain that we, we, we have to do, we should try to um, tease out whatever it is uh, going on in college campuses that's unfair to them. Um, at, at the same time, I, I would caution against drawing too sweeping uh, of a conclusion from their ability to appeal to um, the very academic departments that stand to gain the most from uh, fr from their demands, right? Um, uh, of course, when you're demanding that the Africana Studies Department get five more faculty members in the budget and that the existing faculty members all get tenure, um, it, it isn't too big of a stretch to be able to convince that department uh, that the things that you're calling for are good. I'm not accusing them of cynicism. I'm just saying that you know, I mean, if, if people, if people the are in the they're streets, they're demanding that it not be a, a hostile campus. Like, you know, I don't see a self-serving aspect to what the to the support of the African American faculty, except that they understand and have studied this in you know a really rigorous way, and they agree with what the protesters are saying, which is not that there should be more money given to AAS, although there probably should, but that there's this that there are these problems with this campus and the fact that the faculty who are intellectuals who can't be dismissed as easily as students can are saying this, are saying that they feel the same things about Princeton. Um, I don't think that it's, it's right to, to dismiss that as self-serving or, or cynicism. Well, I, I'm, I, I wasn't trying to dismiss it. As I said, um, they're formidable faculty that agree with them and that's a point in their favor. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I've talked to a ton of faculty members around the country, um, and there are certainly prominent faculty members, prominent black faculty members who are dismayed about what these students are doing. Also tenured people who are very formidable at Ivy League institutions. Um, my read from talking to a bunch of these people at different institutions is that, um, you know, these students are in some sense operating as the intellectual heirs of uh, critical race theorists of sociology departments, um, their ideology matches these departments most closely. And the kinds of changes that they're calling for um, are, are basically calling for, they're basically saying, look, what these departments are doing is undervalued and uh, ought to be, ought to have more resources, ought to have more um, ability to shape the institution. Um, one needn't think that these people are being mercenary or disingenuous to see that, you know, look, if 20 years from now I'm in a journalism department and a bunch of students are protesting saying that the journalism department ought to uh, have a bunch more resources to do the important work that we're doing, and especially that theory that was pioneered by Connor Friedersdorf 20 years ago, um, that really needs to be something that everyone is taught right when they get to the institution. I I'm, of course, going to have uh, a bias toward that sort of thing, and I think that if we're talking about what can we take from these faculty, uh, these particular faculty supporting this, certainly uh, there are formidable thinkers and writers, uh, you know, and if Cornell West is going to say, these are the reasons that I think you should support the Princeton students, hey, I'm listening and I'm going to take him seriously. Uh, I, I think it's also important to understand the context of the university and why they're getting more support uh, from black faculty members, uh, you know, coming out of the critical race theory paradigm than black faculty members coming out of law schools or uh, economics departments, right? Um, it, it's just uh, these incentives do matter. And there's a degree to which everyone on these college campuses are looking at the student protests. And whether it's tenured faculty, whether it's uh, adjunct faculty, whether it's uh, administrators, staff, everyone else is thinking on some level, okay, Here's how the power is shifting under my feet. How am I going to position myself within this university to get the things done that I really do want to get done by, um, you know, taking advantage of the situation. It's just how institutions work. And one needn't think that any individual person is being cynical or disingenuous to, uh, you know, to understand institutional incentives. Yeah, I just, I... I, I don't think it's really about those kind of 
intellectual academic consequences of the, of the protest that people, students or faculty are responding to. I mean, these, these are issues that really reach into people's lives and, you know, the way that they are treated and perceived. And I think that it's really a much more, I mean, they're, the critical race theorists are the ones that are saying that this, you know, who are talking about white supremacy and they're not responding to like their theories being validated. They're responding to the theory, the things that their theories are talking about being recognized. Um, I think, you know, there's a tendency to sort of like intellectualize these issues and, you know, make them about like, I don't know what's, what system of, you know, what kind of course material is, is right. But I think at the end of the day, people are protesting not because their theories are being invalidated, but because their, you know, their lives are being, they're being made unwelcome and uncomfortable. And this system of, you know, white supremacy, I, whatever you want to call it, that has all of these nefarious effects that we can point to also has nefarious effects that we can't point to, but that people still experience and wanting validation of that. And I, you know, I, I'm incredibly sympathetic to that. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to, to large parts of it. And I, I do, part of me cringes when I hear you say, um, that people are intellectualizing these things and you're making that statement as a criticism because, um, <laughs> because you're an undergraduate at an Ivy league institution and you seem implicitly to have bought into something that I associate with kind of like reactionary conservatism that to say that you're intellectualizing something is uh, a negative and a bad thing instead of, uh, of course you're intellectualizing it. You're in an Ivy League institution and you have a deep belief that uh, scholarship and debate and uh, intellectual life is a useful force toward understanding rigorously and improving things. Uh, and that, that that is precisely the thing that you want to do when you take a problem seriously. Um, and what you don't want to do uh, if you take a problem seriously is to persist in uh, anecdote and ideology and emotionalism is the right way to solve it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an anti-intellectual, and I don't think the protesters are either. They, you know, employ, they are employing these sophisticated critical theories. What I meant to say by intellectualizing is that there's a sense in which you can have a conversation on a very academic level without realizing that the things that you're talking about are affecting the lived experiences of people every day. And I think that's something that people suffer from not understanding. Um, right. Again, but, but again, it, it doesn't, they're not, <laughs> it isn't by saying like, I think you just did it again. Like when the word you reached for that time was having these discussions on an academic level, as if, as if to talk about something on an academic level is to talk about it in a way that's just completely disconnected from reality and, and the real world. Right. Which is a critique of academia uh, and is perhaps true of some things in academic life, but Surely we ought to aspire to precisely talking about these things in an academic way um, that, that is attached to their real lives. Like, and I really think that this is a fault line that we're seeing with the campuses that, that um, some people are saying, no, we need to be intellectual and academic about adjudicating these controversies. And other people are saying, no, that is uh, problematic. We need to reach for these other modes. I don't know. Um, I, I'm a little bit confused about that, but yeah. I'll, I mean, nobody's, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be having a conversation in an intellectual way. I think that's what we're having right now. Absolutely, I'm just yeah. saying that that conversation, I just, I'm just saying that conversation should not completely neglect the reasons that we're having it, which is that people are speaking up about things that are happening. And I think that there is a real danger of that happening. So just to give an example of it, because I feel like I'm, Maybe not representing it in the right. Anyway, there was a forum at Princeton recently, um, last week actually. Oh. Um, and it was, sorry, my phone is low battery. Um, <laughs> it was a forum on free speech. Um, and it was clearly done in response to the protest. It was, it was hosted by the local, I mean, the local, the campus newspaper. Yeah. And it featured Peter Singer, very prominent philosopher, um, a couple of students. Um, and one, one, uh, one of the students was a BJL member and Peter Singer and also another person that I brought, they discussed free speech in a very 
ideal sort of way. You know, they, they reach to John Stuart Mill, they reach to, you know, the ideals of free speech. Yeah. Um, and like nobody, nobody disputes that those ideals are, you know, valuable, that they have gone into practice to a certain extent. It's just that that conversation was completely detached from the history of the, the ways that those ideals have been manifested in American society. And it was completely detached from the issue that was actually at play. You know, so the, the fact that we could just have these abstract conversations about free speech without really talking about the issues that precipitated the conversation. That's what I'm talking about when I'm saying intellectualizing. There's this tendency to revert to kind of the the intellectual history that you have with a certain topic without thinking about the particularities of how it's being invoked in the moment. Sure. Um, and I think Peter Singer was completely missing the point by just talking about John Stuart Mill. There's a much more pressing thing that's going on in the present moment. Um, and I think it neglects like a very real history of how those ideals are, you know, manifest in everyday environment, you know, interactions and situations. Um, it, it's, you know, I, I, I won't, um, I won't say you're wrong about this talk because, you know, I wasn't there and you're obviously more aware of the context than I am. Uh, it, it does strike me that um, I don't think you're right when you say that when you say Peter Sanger was talking about John Stuart Mill and it was very abstract and no one would disagree with that. But I, I mean, there are certainly lots of tenured faculty members on American college campuses who would vehemently disagree with John Stuart Mill's ideas about free speech and uh, are precisely saying that the free speech ideas that we, insofar as we protect free speech on college campuses, it ought to be in a more narrow, limited way than John Stuart Mill would protect it. Um, th that, that his free speech protection, his notion of free speech protections are naive and pernicious and only allow people with uh, power to continue to advantage themselves, right? And, and the other side of the debate uh, is in some sense saying, no, John Stuart Mill had it right. His ideas are the ideas we ought to be applying on, on college campuses today. Um, I, 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 I'm sympathetic to the idea that that isn't the only conversation we should be having right now about what's going on on college campuses. I'm certainly trying to have a wider conversation in the kinds of reporting that I'm doing right now. And I think other people are uh, writing about different angles. I do think that that is part of the conversation. I think that did John Stuart Mill have it right about free speech and what does that mean for college campuses is an entirely appropriate thing and a very relevant thing to be talking about on college campuses right now. Even if, you know, talking about Mill is abstract, um, applying his ideas to college campuses today, whether we ought to or not, um, it, it isn't abstract. Does that make sense? I think so. I, I don't know. I guess there's sort of an assumption in those conversations about Mill or whatever that this ideal of free speech that's kind of commonplace, like that's enshrined in the First Amendment, whatever, that it is one like, that it, it currently exists, that right now everyone has this kind of complete freedom of speech and that right now we're contending with people trying to strip that away. Mm -hmm. Whereas free speech, like any policy, is enacted in a very particular way. And historically, we could see how the ideal that is enshrined in, in the First Amendment has has been, you know, has come down selectively to Americans. I mean, you know, in the time when the First Amendment was written, the, there were all sorts of people who didn't have any kind of right to free speech. And there continue to be pe certain people's voices who are much more heard than others. So I don't think that we've even reached the ideal of free speech that we could worry about being eroded. And I think there's this assumption that, you know, by saying that there's something wrong with the current climate, people are kind of challenging these these kind of fundamental free speech rights when, you know, historically we've never even had or certain people have never even had this this kind of ideal of free speech diffused to them. Um, Does that make sense? I guess. Well, so I think maybe we don't have time to get into um, this whole conversation right now. Um, sure. I, I would, I, I would point people to a really good piece that Henry Louis Gates wrote in the New Republic um, years ago, in like 1992, I think, maybe 1989. You can find it on Google Books, uh, and it's a kind of review of the intellectual history of the critical race theorists uh, 
um, ideas about free speech and how they ought to be implemented on college campuses. Um, he comes down in a particular way, but it's also, uh, I think, a pretty even-handed survey of the argument and also at least gives people um, tips on who to read if, if, if they want to look into this more. Um, we're, we're, we're well in there, so I, maybe to close, let me just ask you, um, let me ask you one question. Um, sure. Uh, I think that for me, having conversations like this with people like you, um, w one thing that strikes me is I think that maybe we have um, an implicit disagreement about the degree to which some of the ideas and solutions being suggested on college campuses are actually matters of contested ideology as opposed to um, matters of common sense that we're just disagreeing about whether or not we ought to emphasize them. So what would you say if a group of college students got together and wanted to have an orientation that all students went through at the beginning of every year? And the thing that they wanted them to understand was the importance of the tradition of individualism in American life and the way that it has been eroded and the, uh, the many gains that were made in America, these students would say, uh, under the ideology of the prevailing ideology of colorblindness that the majority held uh, starting in, you know, the late 1950s, early 1960s, uh, part of partly being like a white interpretation of what MLK was saying, extending throughout the civil rights years and, and coinciding with all these gains and rights and making the case that uh, colorblindness uh, w was undervalued and people were behaving in problematic ways by not being colorblind. And that ought to uh, be taught in our campuses so that uh, there are more welcoming environments for students of color and so that there is uh, people are striving more against implicit bias, right? Um, I, I, those, by the way, aren't, that isn't the thing that I would implement on college campuses. Uh, it's just a hypothetical of, of like, I assume that you would disagree with that. Uh, but what kinds of arguments would you marshal against it? So I'm not, I'm not entirely sure I understood that entire um, situation. Uh -huh. or, or rather the specific thing that you were saying would be implemented in this hypothetical. Um, if, if, if you if you want a simple if you want a you're, simpler saying, you're saying uh, imagine that Clarence sorry, imagine ahead. that Clarence Thomas uh, someone who has uh, I think we would both agree um, earnest concern for the climate on college campuses but radically different notions of um, the reality of race in America whether affirmative action is a um, is a force for good or evil what if he were to design the orientation for um, understanding race in America that students were to have at the beginning? Like, what, what's the objection? Uh, what's the objection to some version of that that you disagree with, other than I disagree with it? What's the principled objection that distinguishes it from the kinds of um, educative sessions that you're calling for, uh, albeit with the viewpoint that you agree with? I guess... I think there's, I don't know, I, there's an interesting thing that happens where we kind of take this conversation as if we are the ones that have the power to like decide whether or not it's going to happen. I'm sorry, you're, like you're cutting our out. Own, Could you say that again? Sorry, I think a lot of these conversations are framed as it, as if we kind of are sitting with the lever of like whether or not this is going to happen. Uh -huh. Whereas our support of a certain policy as students, as people advocating for something, is only ever going to put pressure on an administration and different administrations are going to react in different ways. You know, at more liberal arts, progressive universities whose ideologies are already in line with a lot of what the protesters are saying, there's going to be more changes that are being made. Uh -huh. And at other universities that are more traditionally conservative or just in general disagree with the things that are being demanded, the changes are not going to be made. What the protesters are saying is that these are the changes that like, we want this to see made. These are what we advocate for. Yeah. Right now, to the best of my knowledge, nobody is advocating for the Clarence Thomas-like thing at Princeton. But by 
protesting by putting the things that we're saying into the conversation, we articulate what our what our institution's stance is. And like Princeton may or may not accede to the demands. They may accede to some of them and to others, but the act of protesting and demanding that things happen help articulate what the institution's position on certain things is. And I think that's like a valuable exercise. And I think that I would welcome a group advocating what you were saying, because if the university accepted that kind of Clarence Thomas definition of, of sorry, whatever it was that you're proposing, yeah. that would say a lot about Princeton. So I think that, you know, there's this kind of tendency to take the, the protesters demands as if they're going to be implemented all of them tomorrow. Yeah. And that's just never the case. And I think that it's really valuable to have people pushing institutions to articulate what their stances are on certain things, because in the, you know, our institution in particular, Princeton, has a very poor track record on a lot of these issues. So I think it's valuable having a knowledge of what kind of institution you're at. And as a student who's part of it, trying to shape it and trying to shape it in a more progressive way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I know that wasn't really a direct answer. Yeah, to no, that's, question, that's fair. That's, and I think you make a really good point. Um, um, I, I guess my only response is that um, it's – Protests are really good at raising awareness and are and are forcing institutions to have these conversations that they probably wouldn't otherwise have, and that's, in my estimation, a good thing. And I know you agree with that part. Um, I, I worry that even though they're forcing some conversations that probably wouldn't be had otherwise, uh, the protest mode isn't the most useful framework for um, for ha for hashing out contesting ideas, contested ideas, and uh, and so there's a tension there. It, it, it's like. Maybe some conversations you only get to have if you have protests, but then once you have protests, um, it's harder to have some conversations. Uh, I, yeah, I think what protests do is that they they signal that this is a pressing issue that needs to be discussed. Because I don't, you know, it's kind of funny when people talk about how the Wilson debate is like erasing history or like a simplified version of history, because the the demands of the protesters have led to a more vigorous public scrutiny towards Wilson's legacy than anything else I've seen in the last decade. I totally and, agree. Yeah. You know, and I think that there's like an intrinsic value to that. And, you know, while pro like it's impossible for something that is written as a demand to be, to express all the nuance of individual people's views on things. But the fact that they're stimulating conversations like the one that we're having, the fact that they're stimulating conversations in like main newspapers, but also, you know, all across campuses, I think that's a valuable thing. And I think that the fact that there's so much back and forth um, points to you know, the fact that these conversations need to be had and that, you know, just by the fact that they weren't being had in the same way before yeah. and that they are now is already something like invaluable of the protest. You know, well, I agree. I, radical, I agree. Yeah. Radical movements are always going to be more radical than whatever is going to end up being put into place. But they serve a really valuable function in forcing these conversations to happen and in pushing institutions in a certain way. Um, well, I yeah. and, you know, I. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, I mean, I wouldn't make that as a blanket statement of all radical movements. Um, I, I think that they have, look, um, the Ku Klux Klan was a radical movement, right? Like, there are radical movements that can have good effects as well as pernicious effects. I certainly uh, don't think that the student protests today are having a pernicious effect. Um, but to return to where we started, um, you know, I think that part of what the press is doing in the best of its coverage of these issues, and I'm not talking about like the trolley New York Post articles that are just kind of mocking the students, but um, I think the best of the coverage of these issues um, is carrying out the conversation that radical protest spurred in a medium that is more likely to hash out the costs and benefits and to look at it rigorously than college campuses are able to do because um, – so many people on college campuses on both sides of this debate are terrified of speaking out under their own name to make points that at least the ones they email to me seem pretty like legitimate, whatever, you know, people agree or disagree, but they're well within the bounds of normal discourse. And so I guess my ultimate defense of the media's coverage of these stories, whether it be free speech or uh, any of the other uh, issues that the college students are raising and which I've seen covered in a bunch of different publications is that thank God the media is here to hash out these conversations, albeit imperfectly. The media is obviously very imperfect itself, but I think that the press and, you know, alumni on Facebook and the whole broader public discourse on campus 
talking about this and being interested in it instead of just ignoring the students as would have happened with previous protests, perhaps in past generations, is ultimately a good thing, not, uh, not a pernicious thing. I guess I just, I see the media's effect as kind of empowering a very certain crowd in this discussion to speak and stigmatizing another by kind of saying, you know, I don't know. I don't think that it's just this, you know, very nuanced discussion that's being played out in the press. I think that the, the way that the protests have been handled have, like, you know, taken it, for example, the most sensational things that they've been able to get their hands on, which, you know, is the want of, of the press. You know, it's much more interesting to talk about the, the photographer at Missouri who was excluded um, than the overall demands of the, of the protests. And there's a reason why that story caught on a lot more than whatever else was going on that day. Um, so I think that just to think that the presence of the press is this unilateral good and not that it also plays into these power dynamics and thinking about who is really empowering to voice their opinions. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, I think it's obviously a good thing to have, to be having these conversations, but I think it's also, there's a sense in which the media is reinforcing one side of one narrative here. And it's also heavily trivializing, stigmatizing, whatever you want to say it, the other side, um, in, in sort of an unbalanced way. Um, well, that's a, a, a note of disagreement and perhaps not a bad one to end on since we do disagree. If there's anything, you, sure. if, if there's anything else, uh, any final statements you want to say, uh, let me give you the last word, jump in and say it, and then we will end. Um, no, I think this has been a great conversation. <laughs> okay, great. I think we've, we've gone on long enough. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, uh, well, maybe we can do it. Uh, maybe we can do it again at the end of the spring semester and see what uh, w what changes that brings to the conversation. Yeah, I'd love to. That sounds great. Okay, great.